Hi, I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. And the reason this is a special edition is because we are on the streets of Madrid, Spain. In fact, right across the street there is the Ministerio de Agricultura, the Ministry of Agriculture for the entire country of Spain. Now, why would Twyla be coming to you from Spain? That's because LSU Ag Leadership Class 15 is on its capstone international trip, touring farms, ranches, and even a place that has some close ties to Louisiana all across Spain and Portugal. We're gonna wrap up in Lisbon. Now, let's start off with that place that has a close tie to Louisiana. You see, Spain is one of the few countries which actually produces crawfish. Although here, they don't call them crawfish or crayfish. They call them cangrejo de rio. The rice fields around Isla Mayor in southern Spain look a lot like those found in southwestern Louisiana. And just like in Louisiana, these fields are home to the Louisiana red swamp crawfish. Found in the middle of those fields is Alfocan, Europe's number one processor of crawfish. LSU Ag Leadership Class 15 dresses in special blue garb to tour the processing plant. Aaron Lee is a member of the class and raises crawfish in Vermilion Parish. While we were not allowed to bring cameras inside, after the tour, Lee gave his observation. You know, it's essentially just a peeling plant. Uh, very, very stringent on cleanliness. And very strong on output. Alpha Can processes more than 4.4 million pounds of crawfish every year. And all of it is wild caught. That's because the rice farmers may own the land, but once they flood their fields, the water is public. That means anyone can come on their land and trap crawfish. We consider it wild caught here because there is no repopulating. So the, the figure of the farmer is different uh, than the, f uh, the fisherman. Mm -hmm. So you have dedicated fishermen that uh, dedicate their activity to fishing the crawfish, and you have rice farmers, though they might fish, but they're not involved in uh, the life cycle of the crawfish. Nicholas Rue is the general manager for Alpha Can. He says crawfish leave this building either as processed tails, boiled whole, and then frozen, or frozen in a special wine or dill sauce, popular in some countries. We have entered and opened very demanding markets over the last uh, couple of years. Rue says this is the breakdown of exports. 50% of the processed crawfish goes to countries within the European Union, and the other 50% goes to the United States. Those statistics bother Lee. I'm really not a fan of any foreign crawfish coming into the U.S. market. Uh, I mean, I'm, that money in my pocket, that's market share that they're taking from me personally. You know, that's why, you know, things like that hit closer to home to someone like me because that's my livelihood. You know, so any, any outside factors that we have affects me personally. Spain's number one crop? Olives. In fact, Spain is the number one producer of olives in the world. A lot of those olives get pressed into olive oil, which you and I enjoy on our tables every day. And one of the places where they make a lot of olive oil is here at Oleo Algaides. Let's go see how they do it. This is where your olive oil starts. Olive trees dominate the landscape in Spain. In some places, there are olive trees as far as your eyes can see. In the area around Via Nueva de Algaides, Farmers grow three main varieties of olives, Blanca, Picual, and Arbequina. Spain is the biggest producer of olives in the world. Some of the trees you see across the country are old, dating back more than 2,000 years. Most of those olives grown in Spain are used to make olive oil. Oleo Algaides makes between 5,000 and 10,000 metric tons of olive oil every year. The process starts here, where farmers bring their olives. The olives are then washed, cleaned, and sorted. The olives that we receive uh, daily uh, must be processed in not more than 24 hours. The olives then go into the mill where they are crushed. The oil that comes out during this process is sold as extra virgin olive oil. Here you see the olive oil coming out. It will then go into a centrifuge, which will further clarify it and remove the solids. The spent solids, called pumice, can be pressed again and refined. However, that olive oil does not get the extra virgin label. It is sold as olive oil or refined olive oil. You might wonder, who decides how to label olive oil and then checks to make sure what's in the bottle is what's on the label? That is where the International Olive Council comes in. 
Made up of 14 members, including the European Union, the International Olive Council monitors olive oil sales, aids in research, and even works to promote the consumption of olive oil. So, who uses the most olive oil in the world? Us. And by us, I mean the U.S. Before it goes into the bottle, the olive oil is stored in these tanks. Each one holds a truckload of olive oil. For the Spanish, olive oil is not just a commodity, but a source of pride. Of course, we are very proud, very, very proud. Eh? We are the, the, the first uh, country uh, produce, uh, in the olive oil production. And this region is the first region in Spain. Eh? So we are very, very proud. Right now, I'm standing on the banks of the Tagus River in Lisbon, Portugal, and you see the port right there behind me. This is a very important waterway for Lisbon because it empties directly into the Atlantic Ocean. So you may wonder, what floats down this river? Well, cork floats. Cork is actually a very important commodity for Portugal. Portugal is the number one exporter of cork in the world. And as Twyla, as Neil Melanson shows us, there is one company here which makes one third of all bottle toppers in the world. You may not have ever been here, but chances are you've touched a small part of it. This is the Amarim Cork facility, where, as Avery told you, one in every three corks for wine, champagne, and other products in the world are made. We are producing uh, over, at the moment, over 4.6 billion corks here. Joanna Mesquita with Amorim showed Class 15 a small part of those 4.5 billion corks. The cork bark is brought in in sheets and steamed, softening the already pliable wood. It's then separated by both thickness and grade. Here you can see the various grades of cork, with the best being blemish-free. Finally, the cork is punched out of the bark and into these little round segments, which either become champagne stoppers by gluing two or so together, or they're shredded for wine corks. However, before all of that can happen, it has to start here, in the cork forest outside of Avora. Ms. Kita says Amarim recognized just how valuable their partnership with farmers was and today works with them hand in hand. More and more it became a partnership. We discovered with time that you cannot separate the two things. The value of corks is in the raw material, so we totally depend on how well they grow the cork and they, if, if they want to sell it and sell it in good conditions, they depend on us. So the better we work together to make the perfect raw material, they will be happy at the end and we too. If you look east from Avora, you'll see a lot of brown mixed in with the green. That's a lot of arid region of Spain. And further south in Africa, you'll see a literal thin green line separating it from the Sahara Desert. A lot of that is cork trees. It's also a thin green line for agriculture as well. For the whole uh, area around Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, and, and north of Africa, where you find the, the raw material. And this has an impact from an environmental point of view that affects the whole world. From a social and economical point of view, really, this, this areas You have a lot of people depending on this type of job. Uh, the harvesting of the cork is the most well-paid agricultural job in our country, and this has a, a huge influence on the, on the region. So the next time you pop that bottle of wine, remember that even though it's a small thing from a small corner of the world, it has a big impact. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Neil Malasson. When it comes to return on investment, your best bet in Spain is fruits and vegetables. That's because fruits and vegetables are only grown on about 3% of the available farmland on the Iberian Peninsula, but they bring in 35% of the area's farm income. The name TROPS gives you a good idea of what the 2,300 farmers around Malaga, Spain grow. This cooperative is big in avocados and mangoes, both tropical fruits. The co-op is so big, it has its own gas station where workers serve up avocado milkshakes. They seem to be a hit with Ag Leadership Class 15. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Very similar to a milkshake at home, but with a, just an avocado flavor. At nearby Procam, the big crop is cucumber. About 43% of what Procam grows are cucumbers. Avocados and tomatoes round out the major crops here. Founded in 1983, 
Procam grows most of its produce in greenhouses and ships to Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. Production manager Eduardo Maldonado says about 85 percent of the company's production is organic. Maldonado says we discovered that the demand for organic products was increasing and Procam wanted more control of the market with quality products. After speaking with Maldonado and other farmers around Spain, Class 15 learns that the European Union gives subsidies for organic production. For growers at Florida Doñana and Huelva, Spain, organic production is not just a choice, it's a necessity. Flor de Doñana grows fruits and vegetables right in the heart of Doñana National Park. It's also where LSU Ag Leadership Class 15 member and produce farmer Casey Luckett gets to see one of her favorite crops. Yay! Strawberries. Casey and her husband, Derek, grow strawberries and other produce in Pride, Louisiana, north of Baton Rouge. To have our operation this big and be able to be all organic, um, it's pretty neat. While tasting the crop is paramount for all on the tour. This is a fine organic strawberry. I always want one not on my row. Luckett is here to learn how Flor de Doñana can harvest such labor-intensive crops like strawberries and blackberries. How many people do they have working? Are most of them women or men? In temporada máxima, podemos tener unos Technical and quality manager Alba Ramirez responds by saying that of the 300 or so workers on the farm, 85 percent are women. She says that's because women are more gentle with the fruit. The workforce is also local. Spain is coming off of a major recession and still has nearly 20 percent unemployment. That's quite different from Luckett Farms, where the majority of the workers in the field are men and come from Mexico. They don't have as much of a labor challenge as us. It seems like they're able to find local labor who are willing to do the work. Um, which we're not at home. After a healthy helping of knowledge, it's back to the rows of strawberries for another taste. Cheers. Mm. Bueno, very good. That one was good. But how does this Iberian strawberry compare to one from Louisiana? Pretty good, but mine are better. Still to come on this special edition of Twyla from Spain and Portugal, we find out what all the buzz is about here in Spain. Of course, I'm going to be talking about bees. Plus, Neil Melanson tells us about a drink that always makes him think of his wife. Stay with us. Before you sweeten your morning joe, before the icing on the cake, Before the sugar hits the shelf, it begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. The Sugarcane Growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. Farming is my way of life. I chose this career, but farming chose me. A lot of people ask you what you do, and I tell them I'm a farmer. I'm a cattleman. I am a fisherman. I'm a scientist. I'm a steward of the land. I am a farm woman. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am Farm Bureau. I am a Farm Bureau. I know I hope they're fighting today. I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its Oyster Shell Recycling Program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. Thank you for sticking with us on this special edition of Twyla from Spain and Portugal. 
I'm in probably the most beautiful spot that we've stopped yet. This is the balcony of Europe, and it is right on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Sergio Sands is providing the great sounds that you hear right there. He's got a CD that he's selling to folks as they walk by. And the scenery, I mean, the rocks, the houses, the water, everything is just absolutely gorgeous. I don't know that I'm going to come back to Louisiana after being here because the weather is absolutely perfect. But you know what else is perfect around here? the horses. The Pura Raza Española is a breed of horse that is indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula. Now you probably know it as the Andalusian horse. It's been a breed here since the 15th century and it is still riding strong in the 21st century. It's known as the Pura Raza Española, the pure Spanish horse. Its gentle characteristics make it prized and early Romans identified it as an ideal war horse because it took instructions so well. Here at the the Aguada de la Cartuja, they've been breeding them on this property since the 15th century. Set in the hills outside Seville, this Carthusian monastery has records on this horse breed from that time. This is the monastery's original brand, in fact. Patricia Sabajas, head of PR for the now government-run facility, said in all this time, the Cartuja lineage of Andalusian horses haven't changed in genetics or temperament. It's easy to drain. It's true that it's not suitable maybe for jumping or running, but for someone who wants just to ride for pleasure, it's perfect. It's very obedient, very charming, and very, it's a easy learner. This is a typical Andalusian, gray color with shorter legs than most American thoroughbreds. Here you can see the modern brand of the Iguata facility. These horses are also known for their luxurious manes and beautiful dappled coats. It's a very much humanized, we would say. Uh -huh. And that's specifically because of the car, not only because of the physical beauty and the compact of the form and the balance. It's mainly because of the character. So how much for one of these that really isn't a racehorse? Well, they've been sold as much as 5 million euros. Yeah, that's about 6 million in the U.S. Still, many horses go for much less than that, of course. There's about 280 head here at the Iguata School, including this one that was literally born yesterday at the time of the shooting. They're kept penned up only until the foal gets a little stronger. Self-sufficiency here is part of the deal. We grow our own food. We try to be as self-sufficient in that matter as possible. We grow different types of um, like hay, alfalfa, and uh, we have some part of the farm is to pack and use it later on, and some part of the, uh, of the farm is to graze in freedom on different stages of life, on different paddocks. So while you may not be seeing these horses at the racetrack anytime soon, they are unforgettable characters that charmed many in the ag leadership class and me as well. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Neil Malasson. Farmers in Spain and Portugal would not have successful fruit and vegetable crops were it not for successful pollinators. And obviously, pollinators, I'm talking about honeybees. On this trip with LSU Ag Leadership Class 15 are two Louisiana beekeepers who give their perspective on an apiary we visited on the Iberian Peninsula. The hum of buzzing insects may make some people turn and run away, but for Louisiana beekeeper and member of LSU Ag Leadership Class 15, Amy Weeks, it draws her in, well, like a bee to a flower. It's already very different from home. <laughs> Weeks, along with other members of Class 15, are at the Cortesano Honey Ranch, south of Seville. This apiary has about 2,000 hives. The bee bumbler himself, Randy Fair, is an alum of the Ag Leadership Program and is along for the tour. He's here to learn about the challenges Spanish beekeepers face. Beekeepers are all the same. We love our bees, uh, we love our honey, we want to do the best we can for them, but each country has a different problem. Right now ours is the uh, small hive beetle. Uh, here they mentioned the wasp that we don't have yet. <laughs> uh, other countries have a uh, a giant hornet that can just decimate a hive. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad we don't have that either. But it seems like just about all of us have the Varroa, uh, number one decimator killer of the beehives in the world. Weeks is noticing some of the differences. Like the rosemary the beekeeper adds to the smoker. Beekeepers use smokers to make bees less aggressive. I've heard that some herbs do have a more calming effect on the bees, so maybe it does. <laughs> but what they put in their smokers is just one small difference between American and Iberian beekeepers. They have a different race of bee, so that bee itself is managed a little differently. They have a smaller colony, so we 
mite can collect more honey from our bees because we breed specifically for special traits and the Italian bee itself makes more honey and they use the Iberian bee which looked like a smaller nest cavity so um, and they weren't selecting for specific traits that really surprised me I thought they would do more um, picking and selecting. That could change because Iberian beekeepers are noticing less honey from these bees. I wasn't surprised though when he said that uh, honey production was half now what it was 10, 15 years ago because ours is too and they're attributing it to pesticides and I agree partly pesticides but in the U.S. it's also lo loss of floral sources, habitat for pollinators and uh, also the varroa mite. I mean, they're decimating our bees, and they have them here. What the beekeepers at the Cortesano Honey Ranch also have is a thriving agritourism business, complete with a restaurant and gift shop. I like the way they incorporate um, more education into their whole business plan. I thought that was really smart, and if there's room for it, why not do that? Want to know why I love this job? Because I get to go on a trip to Spain and Portugal and stand in one of the coolest places I've been yet. I'm on a rock overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. You can hear the waves. I'm getting hit with the spray and I'm right under the balcony of Europe. How cool is that? And in this precarious position, I'm kind of glad I haven't had too many glasses of the Spanish wine. But after sampling more than a few, I can assure you it's quite tasty. But there is a fortified wine that originates from Spain, mostly used for cooking, but all of it starts with white grapes from southwestern Spain. When you first walk into the Real Tesoro Distillery in Jerez, Spain, it seems more museum than sherry winery. Even the barrels are hidden behind a family legacy that's over 500 years old. To say that it's a museum is no boast. There's an art gallery here on the property. A donor gave more than 100 original Picassos to it alone, making it the envy of many world-class museums by itself. But it does make sherry, a lot of it. Room after room is filled with barrels, upon barrels upon barrels. So many, in fact, that there's warehouses full of them with their own street names. Sherry, like most wines, is more valued the older it gets, and some of these in the main rooms date back to the 1920s. For far longer, though, Real Tesoro has had a relationship with the farmers who bring them their grapes. You can see it mixed in with the barrels and bottles here, old pictures showing a time when farmers brought them in from mules and wagons. Here in the modern era, sherry is at least made in the same way that it used to be. So we increase the alcohol content, we kill the yeast, and produce the sedation process. And that's it. Class 15 got to taste three different kinds from dry to very sweet. Class member and sugar producer Stephen Simino said he got a taste of home from it. This one actually tastes like Steen's syrup. That's the flavor I'm getting. It's a sweet, sweet molasses flavor. Classmate Aaron Pierre agreed, saying he noticed it in the air when he first walked in. It was a strong aroma of just fine smelling wine. It was, it was good. It was like heaven. Sherry's sweet taste is generally seen as a digestif or after dinner drink, but it certainly pairs well with both the taste and culture of Spain. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Neil Malasson. Still to come on this special edition of Twyla from the Iberian Peninsula, why is it important for ag leaders to travel abroad? We'll show you right after this. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife. Recreation. Lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry. Covering half our state, all of our hearts. This is the moment I knew. His future had no boundaries. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org.
slow. That's slow. That's slow. That's slow. Look, he's blushing. I am a giant panda bear, love you, Mamu. I almost went extinct, but I'm not because of you. I am a ghost, and I almost was too. If it wasn't for the help of the San Diego Zoo, how about you join us? Save it as your tortoise. We need your help to bring species back, so bring us back from the brink of extinction. To bring us back from the brink of extinction. I am a brain. This trip to the Iberian Peninsula is just as much about learning as it is for fun. This is the 15th international trip for the LSU Ag Leadership Program. In fact, Twyla's Neil Malasson is a graduate of the program, and he spoke to the coordinator, Dr. Bobby Swallow, about why it is so important for future ag leaders to get outside of the United States. A lot of ground was covered in the 13 days the Ag Leadership class was in Spain and Portugal. In fact, we left quite a bit out of the show, including some things like Iberian ham, which you'll get to see next week. In addition, some of what the class learned about international trade has been left off, but Ag Leadership Director Bobby Swallow said for him, a good understanding was developed not only about these two countries, but about European agriculture and mentality as a whole. Hearing a tour guide talk about their impression, European impression of Americans. That was a great thing for our group to hear because it's all about our impression upon them. Now that she wasn't saying that to the group specifically, she was more or less talking about the general European opinion towards Americans in general. And I think it's important for our group to understand that because if we start talking about trade issues in the future and relations of any kind in the future. That does it for this special edition of Twyla from the Iberian Peninsula. Before we go, I have to thank a few people. First and foremost, Dr. Bobby Swallow and Cheryl Duplachan with the LSU Ag Center. All of your hard work and dedication made this trip a success. And you know, you had a tough job having to wrangle all the cats I call classmates. To Jurgen Noll, thank you. Merci, danke, abrigado. Gracias. I can't speak every language you can, so I can't say thank you in every language that you deserve to be told thank you in, but you definitely showed us a side of Europe that we would not have seen without your help, and uh, you really put some perspective on it, Jurgen, so thank you very much. I need to thank the guy who's standing behind the camera right now, Mr. Neil Malasson, who is also a uh, graduate of the Ag Leadership Program. He's got his headphones on and he's looking into the viewfinder so he can't really come in front of the camera so you can see. If you liked the stories that you saw here, you can watch them again on Facebook, you can follow us on Twitter, you can check us out on Instagram, and also be sure to check out the blogs written by each of the classmates. You can find that at twilatv.org. For all of us here at Twyla, thanks for watching. We hope to see you again right here next week.